Torchlight Independent Media presents Grenada's only source for independent, unbiased, and well-researched broadcast journalism. This is The Bub Report with Dr. Kellon Bub. Hello and welcome to the March 13th edition of The Bub Report. The Russian Federation's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, which began on February 24th, is now going into its full third week with bombardments of both civilian and military sites. The world is truly beginning to see the impacts of this military action, as well as the economic sanctions that have been levied against Russia by Western countries. Several countries with citizenship by investment programs in the Caribbean, including Grenada, temporarily suspended Russian and Belarusian citizens from participating in their programs. This week, we spotlight the continued fallout of the Russian-Ukraine war for Grenada and the Caribbean and raise the issue of diplomatic conflict of interest that was addressed by attorney and former diplomat Anselm Clouden with Grenada's Foreign Affairs and International Business Minister Oliver Joseph. Well, it is a calamitous situation that he has created uh, globally because an ambassador speaks when he speaks. He speaks on behalf of the government, he carries the government flag, and what he says, um, either bilaterally or multilaterally um, or at the UN or other international forum, he is taken to reflect the views and the position of his government. Um, and, and he has created a great catastrophe, the consequences of which could be devastating for the country itself. Also on the report, we sit down with a panel of experts to make sense and bring clarity to a viral social media video involving an altercation between a high school student and a law enforcement officer in Grenada. The student who attends the St. George's Institute High School in the capital has since been slapped with several charges by prosecutors. We ask the question, is this an isolated incident or is this part of a bigger trend line around youth violence in Grenada? What role is mediated communication by way of social media playing in making sense of these events? And what are communities doing to mitigate the fallout from such activities? We welcome our guests, Tyrone Buckmeyer, Director of the Legal Aid and Counseling Clinic, Brenda Lee Johnson James, clinical and community psychologist, author Pear, youth advocate, and the Honorable Oliver Joseph, Grenada's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Business. We thank you for joining us. A pleasant good morning to all our viewers and listeners, and we welcome you to this, the March 13th edition of the Bub Report, certainly a historic day in Grenadian history. And today is also historic for the current ruling administration in St. George's, the new national party. They are commemorating and celebrating four years in office. But of course, we always want to begin with the customary editorial of the week. Now, the brawl between a male student and the law enforcement officer in Grenada has since gone viral in this age of virality and digitally mediated communication. Each of our most outspoken social media friends probably posted about this event and probably also shared it hundreds of times on WhatsApp, highlighting aspects of it that best reinforce their worldview. The collective focus may have now moved on to another outrage and to another viral video that might be making the rounds as we speak. But there was something that only a few people noticed at the moment, a street full of grown adults who looked on without making an intervention in the interest of de-escalating the situation. The act of recording violence events, but staying silent 
is a modern manifestation of the bystander effect. The bystander effect occurs when people refrain from intervening in emergency situations because there are other people around. Psychologists Bib Latant and John Daly, who first demonstrated the bystander effect, attributed this phenomenon to two factors a perceived diffusion of responsibility, which is thinking that someone else in the group will help, as well as social influence, where observers see the inaction of the group as evidence that there is no reason to intervene. Our camera phones may make us feel like social media activists, but when we are recording events instead of intervening, we are actually just real-world bystanders. There is a gulf of dissonance between what we publicly declare as our values online and how we act. Viral videos that incite outrage and prod at our sense of justice and morality demonstrate both the difficulty and the necessity of acting in accordance with our values. We argue so much online about the actions of people who we do not know and will never meet. And this takes time away from looking at our own actions and preparing ourselves to act better in similar situations. For now, those of us who wish to believe in a world where people should look out for each other in the way that we know it as it takes a village to raise a child, we'll have to take it upon ourselves to lead by example. We should learn how to translate our digital frustrations into analog action. And at this time, I wish to welcome our first guest for the Bob Reports March 13th episode. I'm happy to be joined by Grenada's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Business. He's also the Member of Parliament for the St. David constituency. Uh, Minister Oliver Joseph, welcome to the Bob Report. Thank you very much for having me on your program. Absolutely, Minister Joseph. Of course, this is a significant time for your organization, your political organization in government serving the people for four years. So congratulations are in order to you and your party, as well as to your new chairmanship of uh, your, your organization. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Now, Minister Joseph, uh, we invited you here because, of course, uh, some may say that the world is imploding around us, uh, but you are Grenada's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Business, and you would be in a very unique position to answer some very uh, burning questions that the public has. Now, we have been seeing material impacts of the Western economic sanctions on every Russian citizen. For example, they are unable to access funds in some of their banks and are unable to use basic financial services. In fact, the Russian ruble has also dropped significantly in value over the last three weeks. How has this been affecting uh, Grenadian students and Grenadian interests in Russia? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, as we, we, the world witnessed this aggression by Russia in Ukraine is affecting the entire world. We are all interconnected. So while the battle is taking place in Ukraine, the, the war is affecting every nation. First of all, let me deal with the issue of the students. I'll come back later to talk about the impact of such an event on the world itself and mm -hmm. the economic situation. So we have diplomatic relations with Russia. We have an ambassador appointed to Russia and we have an embassy there. And over the years, we have had cordial relationship with the government of Russia. They have offered us several scholarships. They, are prov they have provided assistance to us in several areas. When Russia took that action, the government sent a strong message to the government through our ambassador that war is never used to settle any dispute. And we urge for the immediate withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine and encourage all to sit around the table and get a diplomatic solution to the problem. So we are very clear on this. You do not resolve any conflict by war because what you create is more conflict. So the hostility 
that we are seeing and the loss of lives, we cannot accept that as in the modern era in which we live as a means of settling any dispute. And so we are very clear in our position that the Russian troops must withdraw, Russia must withdraw its troops from Ukraine and go back to the table. Okay, now in the context of the Grenadian students, uh, how are they faring with the sanctions? I mean, we've seen news reports about the way that these sanctions are affecting everyday citizens. I imagine uh, Grenadian students would, would, are not immune from that. Now, would there be a contingency plan, for example, to repatriate Grenadian students if they so choose? And have we been seeing uh, requests from Grenadian students there uh, that, uh, that perhaps uh, indicates that they might want to return home? Yeah. Kellan, currently we only have two students pursuing studies in Russia. Okay. We have four, four in Serbia and three in Romania. These are the neighboring countries. So we are concerned about all nine students. Because when you live in countries like Serbia and Romania that are very close and share borders, where the war is taking place, we are concerned for all our students. Because we have a resident ambassador in Moscow, that has helped us and help and worked in favor of the students because we have reached out to our ambassador to uh, tell say to him that you must get in touch with these students ensure that they are safe and if there are anything things that they need if there are things that they need to be comfortable please let us know and see to the extent to which you can provide assistance to our students mm -hmm. and i must say he has been doing that we have had no requests from these two students in russia to return we have had no requests from the other students to return they are some of them in the final year and they are hoping to complete their education mm -hmm. so their hope is that this war would not be drawn out for very long so they're asking us to wait and let's see and if it's a long drawn out war then they will consider the options but for for the moment they are not making that request and we are in touch with them through our ambassador okay all right very well now minister as 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 minister of international business what would you say would be the financial fallout from the russia ukraine conflict for Grenada. For example, what does foreign direct Russian investment uh, look like in Grenada that uh, uh, Grenadian interests should be concerned about? Yeah. Okay, to be specific with respect to investment from Russia, it comes through largely to the citizenship by investment program. Mm -hmm. We have several Russian applicants that are investing in the in new hotels. For example, the Six Senses Hotel in St. David's, they are investing there. With the sanction and the movement of finances, it will become extremely difficult for Russians to move money because to invest, you have to move money to the host country, in this case, Grenada. And therefore, the sanctions will affect the moving of money to invest in Grenada. And therefore, we are very concerned about this situation. But we, what we, at the same time, understand the need for the sanction since Russia continues to occupy Ukraine. And we must take strong measures to allow for peaceful negotiations. So yes, it is having a negative impact, as I said, on our investment due to the fact that Russian investors are investing through the CBI program that we have in Grenada. Okay. Do you have a number, a, a sense of how many of those uh, Russian uh, investors are currently investing in Grenada? Do you have a a no, I, no, number? no, I do not have a ballpark number because the CBI program is done separately and apart from the ministry. Okay. It's done as a, I, yeah, I, separate. 
Right. I also understand that uh, Grenada has temporarily suspended CBI applications from both yes. uh, so, so, uh, right. Belarus, so I believe, through. and Russia. Yes. yes. Go ahead. With respect, yes. So with respect to the sanctions, we have suspended all application coming from Russians. All. Not just those that are on the sanction list, because you know the U.S. have a list of yes. Russians. Yes. But we uh, say all or the suspension of application from Russia to the CBI program will affect all Russians. And that is the decision that the government has taken, again, in order to protect our investment, to ensure that we are getting genuine investors and not to breach any sanction, that we have taken the decision to suspend it Again, the, the, the hope is that it will not be drawn out so that we can restore it if everything is settled. But at the moment, it is suspended and we will not be accepting any application from Russian citizens and also from Belarus. So both Russia, why, why Belarus? Well, you know, Belarus I, I, I has been I, used. You know, Belarus yeah. is direct on border, right? Mm -hmm. And Belarus is used by the russian to launch attack into ukraine mm -hmm. and therefore we said belarus and and russia their citizens for the time being we have we, sus we have suspended any application from these two countries okay now uh, minister let's get on to another subject that has uh, been making the news in grenada in the last i would say in the last week or so and that has to do with Grenada's ambassador to the World Trade Organization, uh, Mr. Justin Soon, who is himself a cryptocurrency investor. But after a meeting he held with the Russian ambassador to the WTO, uh, and I'm quoting now, uh, he said, quote, I just had a courtesy Zoom call with ambassador of Russia to the WTO. We discuss humanitarian use case of how blockchain like Bitcoin uh, can be implemented for Russian civilians who lack access to financial payment systems. Hope we can collaborate, unquote. Now, Minister Joseph, uh, is Mr. Soon speaking there on his own behalf, or is he speaking on behalf of the government and people of Grenada? Because no, he, that certainly uh, uh, speaks to a kind of conflict of interest there, if you right. are representing Grenada at the World Trade Organization. But here you are talking about, in many respects, ostensibly my, wanting to skirt... Uh, sanctions by, by 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 having monies invested in an alternative market system so i would give you the chance to respond no well he he was not speaking on behalf of the government of grenada the government of grenada is not in in blockchain technology justin is that is his business blockchain technology and using cryptocurrency mm -hmm. he was speaking in his personal capacity however as a new ambassador i don't think he clearly understands how you separate these two. Now, if you are addressing anyone and you use the title of His Excellency, it gives the impression that you are speaking as the ambassador. I mean, that is his Twitter handle, Minister, and right. I would push back. But I would push back there. Mm -hmm. uh, why would we have ambassadors representing the state that do not understand clearly what their terms of reference are? No, not that you don't understand it. Um, everything. Mm -hmm. It's just that he will, he has his business, and he's promoting his business. And if it was not for the war in Ukraine, that post or the tweet would not even draw anybody's attention, mm -hmm. because he does that all over the world and all the time. So he's just, just assuming, well, that's his normal course of business. But I, we wrote to him a strong letter, same to him, first of all, to speak on behalf of Grenada, you must get instruction from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And you must clear any statement that you wish to make as Grenada's ambassador with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Okay. So that was not done. And he, in his mind, he was addressing the issue as Justin Son, cryptocurrency owner and blockchain technology. Okay, so let me uh, play a clip here from uh, Mr. Anselm Clouden, who appeared on uh, uh, Kalistra Farias' program, The Narrative, and I want you to get, you, uh, get your response to that. How could he say, or be hard to say, that Mr. 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 Sun 
can divorce his business um, interests from his ambassadorial appointment. That's why he's appointed in the first case. This is an infantile statement by the minister. And he should resign for embarrassing the, 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 his office. He has to give instructions to Mr. Sun. Mr. Sun shouldn't be heard to speak without instructions from the foreign ministry. All right, uh, th that was uh, Mr. Anselm Clouden there, uh, a former senator, a former legislator, also former ambassador. Uh, he's asking for your resignation. I don't think uh, <laughs> that's something you might be doing. This is an election cycle, sir. Uh, but let me get you to respond. No, that's his view. I'm not responding on his view. Okay. He expressed his view. I um I would I in my put sense of in the become a public figure, I do not respond to people's personal view. Everybody will have a view okay. on the matter, and it's I, I'm not prepared to respond to it. All right, Minister, let us talk about uh, oil and gas interests. Now, I know that in, in 2008, uh, the Prime Minister of Grenada did indicate that uh, Grenada uh, would be ramping up its efforts in this arena. Now that we see an increasing demand for oil, I, I, I'm sure nobody in the diaspora and uh, as a side should be complaining about the price of gas when they visit Grenada because this is an international issue. I just thought that point needs to be made. Um, but are we going to be seeing any efforts to uh, uh, really uh, ramp up or uh, I don't know if revisit would be the right word or to really prioritize perhaps would be a, a better a terminology to use, prioritize oil and gas exploration as was promised. So let me explain why gas exploration did not take place mm -hmm. as, as was promised. So you send an agreement for exploration that will cost millions of dollars. And shortly thereafter, the price of oil on the world market dropped significantly to invest millions of dollars drilling for oil, the investor will have to make sure or have a guaranteed return on his investment. So the drilling of oil did not proceed because of the low price of oil on the world market. And that was a business decision by the investors to postpone the drilling of the oil. Now we have seen, because of the war, a rapid increase in the price of oil. Perhaps the investors may wish to reconsider that now, but also you have to look at the other variables. What if the war ends tomorrow and the oil price go back down? There, are certain, there is a certain level that you'll want to ensure you have oil price at before you start spending millions of dollars into drilling. Remember, the government of Grenada do not have the money to do the drilling. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any country who do it on their own. There are always companies that they hire. Look at Guyana, who is drilling their private companies that are doing the drilling in Guyana. So that is the situation, and that is why the drilling did not take place, and not for no other reason except for the price of oil on the world market. So, 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 so it was just not a brass campaign market. Uh, uh, I'm saying campaign market, a, a campaign promise there. It was just not, uh, are you saying that market forces ultimately made that determination? Yeah. Yes, that is what I'm saying. Yes, at the time the announcement was made, well, it's just like the war game, it changed everything. Listen, we in Grenada, let me tell you, go direct to the impact of the, of the war on, on prices now. Mm -hmm. So you have a war and oil price shoot up it affects everything. It affects our import, our fuel charges. The fuel to manufacture goods increase, and therefore there will be an increase in prices. The whole supply chain has been disrupted as a result of the increase in world prices. So oil as a direct result of the war in Ukraine and therefore, you can see wall prices increasing to the extent where you see the United States having talks with Venezuela. 
Which was a very interesting development. <laughs> but that is <laughs> but, but that's geopolitics, yeah. Exactly. That mm -hmm. is geopolitics. In in international relations, you have to understand that what is in your national interest and how best to serve your national interests. We are small in the global scene, but we stand for principle. And once you stand for principle and take a principle position you will always be on the right path. And that is what we have done. We are called upon by other big countries to recognize Guaido. I'm just using that as an example. And we stay, say, stay with course. And we said, we believe in democratically elected governments. And Guaido is not a democratically elected president. And on that basis, we cannot recognize him. When you stand, as I say, when you stand for principle, you're always rewarded for standing up for principle. So the, 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 there will be a ripple effect of, of this war. I, my hope and my prayer is that it will not be prolonged because we cannot sustain these increased prices. Inflation is defined as a sustained increase in prices. And we have no control. We are a net food importing country. So the price of food will escalate. Inflation will increase because that's all as a direct result of the increase in oil prices. So we will feel it. The rest of the world will feel the effect of this war because of the increase in oil prices. Okay, Minister, let us segue into uh, some politics uh, before uh, we... We end this conversation today. And uh, first of all, uh, you are the member of parliament for the constituency of St. David. That constituency uh, is receiving a lot of attention these days um, because the political leader of the National Democratic Congress would also be contesting in that constituency. What is your machinery looking like in that constituency at the moment in the build up to the next election? We are in preparation mode. So preparation mode for us involves registering our supporters and ensure that all of our supporters are registered to vote whenever election is called. Canv canvassing the list of the elect electorate so that we can identify our supporters, reaching out, to the people in the constituency, all this work are taking place. And this month, in the month of March, we're targeted to complete the canvassing and to do the visits and meet with all the polling division. Because St. Davis, as you know, is the largest constituency. We know over 9,000 registered voters with 12 polling divisions and 52 communities to visit. But we have our, we are a well organized party. We follow the structure. A party that won the most election ever in the history of Grenada must be must know how to win election. So our party machinery is in is in effect in full gear. It's and we are fully very confident. Yeah. yeah, you you are confident, uh, Minister. You say, but you you said something there that that you're reaching out to your supporters. Are you only reaching out to supporters? Are you not? which are casting uh, your net as far and wide as possible? No, well, we are looking for new voters as well. <laughs> no, but okay. to register. No, no, I'm saying for registration, we register in all voters. We can go along registering the opposition voters. That is for the opposition to do. I don't know no political party that will bring NNP supporters to get registered to vote against them. That's just a natural thing. So I'm saying when we are providing goods and services for everybody. When we do projects in the Constitution, that's for everybody. But I'm talking specifically of the preparation work, the registration, the canvassing. These things are done among our supporters. That is where we are registering. And that is who we have to register, our supporters. Because the election will boil down to the number of supporters you have for each party that will determine whether you win or lose the election. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that all our supporters are registered. That is what I'm saying. 
So, 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 so in essence, uh, uh, in the prime minister's words, you would be ready for the paratrooper. That, that's your opponent. That's uh, what he calls your opponent, the paratrooper. Well, there are a lot of different adjectives you could use, but I'm ready for my opponent. Okay. That is all You're I'm ready. ready to say. Right. Yes, I'm ready. And, 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 and you are confident that you would also be the, the, the candidate? And, and, and the backdrop of the question is, and I want you to respond to this, that uh, and, and, and those are not confirmed reports, and we are not going to uh, report anything that's not confirmed. So we want to hear it from you. Uh, do you have, is there someone else? Uh, we have been hearing, for example, Ambassador Yolan Smith. Has she expressed interest in uh, becoming a candidate uh, in the constituency of St. David? Or is this just uh, 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 unconfirmed allegations and rumors? Well, I've not heard that from the party. I've not heard about any other candidate name for the constituency, constituency of St. David's from the party. As far as I know, I am the only, I'm the caretaker, and the only caretaker for St. David's as put forward by the party at this time, at this point in time. So Yolan Smith is not working with your constituency branch or with the party? Not as far as I'm aware. Not as far as you're away, okay. okay. All right, uh, we, we have the tape, so we will be <laughs> we would be getting back to the tape if 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 it, it turns out to be different. But Minister, we want to give you an opportunity uh, for for some closing comments with respect to the fourth anniversary of uh, your party as uh, uh, serving the people of Grenada in governance. If you were to rate your party's uh, tenure in office, what grade would you give your organization? Certainly. I don't think any erudite person would want to give themselves an A plus because that might be uh, uh, boasting a little bit. Wouldn't you not say that? We, well, we have all the right to boast because we came into office in 2018 and in 2020 you had a pandemic. So you only had one good year, 2019, mm -hmm. where the economy grew by 5% and we had a surplus on the recurrent expenditure. The economy was doing well. Ranked highly by the World Bank, the IMF, the CDB, and the ECCB. And then all of a sudden, 2020 come pandemic, they come, and what happened? Economy took a dive because we had to close our port. St. George's University, that contributes 20 to 25% of GDP, closed and the students went back. Tourism, which we depend on heavily. The hotels closed because the port closed and the people were not traveling. So it took a big hit. And even with the drop in finances and revenue, we were able to keep every government employee on the payroll and pay on time and pay increases in salary for 2020, 2021, and 2022. 4%, 4%, 4%. During a pandemic, there's no other CARICOM country that did that. And I, I'm, I'm sure if you do a survey of the entire world, there might not be a next country that paid its workers. I'm talking about the state, employees of the state now. 12% increase during a pandemic. And in addition, last December, we paid one month bonus to frontline workers and a half month to all other workers that are employed by the state. And I, you will do the assessment for yourself, having given you the facts as they are. We're able to maintain, keep people safe, able to maintain every job. We're able to pay salaries on time. And the IMF in the Last review of Grenada did give credit Grenada for the way we handled the economy. But we were only able to do that because in the previous five years, we introduced a number of legislation that caused us to, to be fiscally disciplined. And we had a savings. And that is why we could have used from the savings to now meet our recurrent expenditure while other countries were borrowing and sending, sending home workers. And I think I will present the facts and let rational people come to their own conclusion. 
All right, uh, Minister Joseph, thank you so much for agreeing to appear on the Burb Report. I must say that uh, you're one of the, the ministers in the government who always agree to appear on on platforms. Uh, not not all ministers do that in your government, uh, but some do, and those who do are very uh, forthright and forthcoming. So we thank you for appearing on the program, sir. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Hello, I'm Dr. Kellan Bubb of the PBC graduating class of 1997 and the current president of the PBC Alumni Association of New York. I take this time to extend a warm and fraternal greetings to my alma mater on behalf of the Alumni Associations in New York and Toronto, as well as all the diaspora support groups in North America and Europe who continue to give back to the institution. We are proud to join the Presentation Brothers College as it celebrates 75 years of quality service to education in Grenada. I can testify without reservation that PBC has had a strong and formative influence on what I've become in keeping with the motto of our school song, as well as the 75th anniversary theme. In that regard, we are encouraging all PBC past students and well-wishers to be cheerful givers in this our 75th year and to give back to the institution that has given us so much. Please make sure to donate to our GoToFET link at gotofet.com, as well as to our 75th anniversary bank account located at the Grenada Cooperative Bank. Please also ensure that you follow all our social media pages for timely updates on our upcoming events over the next 11 months. Finally, please ensure that you are completing the registration information so that we can keep you updated on all our PBC events. Once again, happy anniversary to my great alma mater and long may you prosper. And uh, we welcome you back to the Bub Report as we advertise on our program this week. We will be having a conversation on uh, the state of youth violence in Grenada. Is it an issue that uh, we have to be worried about? Is there trends? Are there particular trend lines uh, that we are currently seeing in society that did not exist before? And how do we address these concerns, these trend lines, if they exist? Uh, and so to help me make sense of this issue. I've, I've brought together three experts from Grenada who can speak to this issue, uh, people who actually work with that population. And so I'm happy to be joined, ladies first, uh, by uh, uh, Brenda Lee Johnson-James. Brenda Lee, welcome to the Bub Report. Thank you, Bob, for having me on uh, this and of the report. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as well as uh, Mr. Arthur Pear. Mr. Arthur Pear, is a youth advocate and he is someone who has worked with young people for a long time, as well as Mr. Tyrone Buckmeyer, who is the director of the Legal Aid and Counseling Clinic in Grenada. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, thank thank you, you very you. much, Doc. A good evening. Afternoon. Absolutely. Good evening, good evening all. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, my so, Absolutely. So what we want to do, gentlemen and lady, we have seen the video that has been circulating that has since gone viral. We live in an age of, of viral moments. Uh, and I, I sometimes think that these viral moments uh, tend to define our issues uh, from a very narrow lens. And so let us begin with you. Based on the video that we've seen, uh, Brenda Lee, uh, what was your initial reaction and, and, and what did you see there? What layers are you able to, to unpack there for us? All right, so my initial, I had a physiological reaction. My, my stomach turned, my heart was broken. And I literally looked at the video, Dr. Bob, six times. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was trying to do exactly what you asked me. I saw rage. I saw some measure of disrespect. I saw some measure of probably embarrassment. 
and um, tolerance, you know, for just taking a moment before dealing with a situation and processing it. It was very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very well. Uh, Mr. Pay and Mr. McMire, what did you see? <sighs> well, my first reaction when I saw the video, actually, Dr. Bob, is precisely what you said. It created a viral moment that I immediately feared would be blown out of all proportion and create precisely the kind of immediate angry reaction that we have in fact seen, mm -hmm. but that will not necessarily allow us to look at the issue, put it into perspective and deal with it. It was unfortunate um, that such an incident happened. It worries me as, a, as somebody who has dedicated my entire professional life to working with young people to help them find different and, and better ways to deal with conflict and anger and so forth. And it worries me as a parent um, that we are still in a place where this kind of thing happens so frequently. But I think we should not tell ourselves that all is lost and throw up our hands in despair, because I also think we have opportunities to help young people deal better with situations like that. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Pear? I, I think with the two colleagues that went before me, I do agree with them. Trust me, it, uh, it was pretty shocking to me at this time. Um, mm -hmm. And it brought back memories of the spate of violence that we had between the years 2005 to 2008, um, where we had somewhat of, for want of a better word, um, we had issues of gang violence. Now, when I saw that open display of defiance, um, disrespect, uh, and share violence as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, it, it really it broke my heart. Um, understanding where young men coming are coming from, and sometimes the the ego and the and the bravado that you you may want to display, especially when you have friends around you, um, you know it it really it really saddened me to see that sort of display in open in public. Now, as 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 as, as counselors and psychologists uh, and as advocates who work with young people, Brenda Lee, your, your the quality of your stream seems slightly better, which is good. Um, what, and obviously, as I said, we do not have much further context. We have that piece of video, and I believe another piece of video was released, but obviously there was more context there that I think needs to be added in order for there to be a complete treatment to the issue. Mm -hmm. But based on what you saw, uh, how could that have situation, how could that situation have been better handled? I know that the, uh, the, the, the school, that's the St. George's Institute, uh, where the young man uh, is a student, they released a statement. Uh, and the thesis of the statement essentially uh, made the point that perhaps this situation could have handled better by law enforcement uh, in terms of de-escalating. So as, as, as people who work with young people, uh, how would you have advised uh, the parties involved, especially law enforcement, to deal with this situation differently? Brenda Lee? I think violence begets violence, right? I, when I looked at the video, the, the little part that I saw, I saw that the police exercised a measure of restraint, right? And after pleading and maybe trying to get the young man to regulate himself, the young man pushed him. And I guess as Mr. Pierce said, ego and you know, people are there and people are saying the police and whatever, he probably got upset and um, he reacted. Was that the best reaction in the moment? I do not think, well, reacting on impulse, we could say that, right? Um, those of us who are away from the situation and looking at it, we might say, oh, he should not have done that. But I suspect he reacted on impulse. Um, we have to learn to make decisions to diffuse th these situations by practicing pause, okay? We have to be able to pause. There is a moment between when the situation occurs and when you have to make the decision. And we have to learn and teach our young people to stop and think before they proceed. Gentlemen, uh, was there... 
an opportunity for there to be a de-escalation in that situation? Always, always in situations like this, when we look at it after the fact, we can all have our opinions as to what could have been done. But remember, these things happen, it happen in a matter of seconds, right? And people are reacting on different levels at the same time. Like Brenda Lee, and I said this to Arthur in a private conversation two nights ago, I actually saw the policeman ex exercising a degree of restraint, which I thought was, was admirable given the circumstances of the situation. Mm -hmm. But of course, it is always preferable if both professionals and young people in any kind of conflict situation would, would, would have a stop, a, a quick stop and think about what my next action could be and what could be the potential implications of my next action. But uh, is any of us in a position to say it should have been done this way or that way? I don't think so, because this was really a fast moving situation. Mm -hmm. And in the end, persons will react in the way that they feel give them the best advantage. That said, we do believe at Legal Aid and Cox Clinic has invested tremendous amount of resources working with other partners in the society to try to teach people conflict management skills. Mm -hmm. That when you are in a situation where you realize things might escalate to a point that becomes potentially problematic, you stop, you think, you walk away, etc. But in theory, that's a lot easier to discuss and explain in a classroom setting that when the situation is fast unfolded in real time and both sides are being egged on or taunted by others and then the ego and other, other realities kick in. So I think we need to understand that we need to continue to invest in these kinds of programs so that people learn ways to manage conflict effectively, but also we have to make allowance for the human element and just hope to God that People think before they act whenever situations arise that that are conflicted. Mr. Fair? Thinking before you act is, is certainly the, the best way to go. <clears throat> um, it gives you an opportunity to really and truly um, you know, see what your next action is and how best you could calm the situation. And that's that's first and foremost. However, um, if you look at the situation with the with the police officer, he has a responsibility. He has his job to do. He's motivated by his by his his job. Look, this is a situation where I need to apprehend this particular individual, um, and that individual is res is resisting. Um, I need to do that um, in a way that looks professional. Now, the other thing is that he's a he is an element. Uh, he is a product of our society. He is a product of of the of a community. He's a product of of a family. Um, and having that authority, having, having that responsibility as, a, as one to uphold the law or to enforce the law, and you have somebody you know, um, contravening that, uh, it sometimes it creates a problem for, for the individual, and he may, he may not necessarily think. As it relates to the student, um, he may have his friends around him, um, and that might be a motivation to show that, look, um, nobody in treating me like this or nobody in talking to me like this. And of course, you may have that, that um, explosion of, of, of negative behavior being displayed in public. Now, we, we as Mr. Mr. Buckmeyer said, and as certainly as um, Brenda Lee intonated, um, we need to really and truly, you know, teach people how to take a, take a pause, how to take a time out and really deal with the situation. That, what happened there, may not have been a best place to do it, because you, it, it's in the public eye. You had to, I mean, other police officers were attracted to the, to the incident, mm -hmm. um, and they were trying as much as possible, as best as was possible, um, to really bring some sort of um, resolution to the, to the whole issue. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, so, I, I will play a bit of a devil's advocate here, and... Uh, I really want to get a sense of whether this is, is something, and I'm going to bring the entire panel back here, whether this is something new because of the presence of social media and because everyone has a smartphone and a camera phone that records everyday interactions, or has this been happening in society for a long time? I do remember uh, my days in school when we had fights <laughs> and uh, the same sort of situation occurred. The difference then was that you did not have cameras. There were no smartphones around. So uh, are we seeing a situation where 
uh, the presence of smartphones and the presence of social media is amplifying a situation mm -hmm. that has always been existing in society? Or are we seeing trend lines that are looking really bad for the way that young people deal with conflict in Grenada? Any one of you can, can start there. Brenda Lee, anybody? So I think, I think you're correct. It, it has been happening before, but social media, and there is the, the sensationalism, you know, um, the posting of it and the taking it and making it a WhatsApp status is and sharing and um, it's not condemned by the peers. Rather, they're giving them um, props as they would see for it, you know. So, um, and with the social media, which is not only the WhatsApp, but the video games and the movies and the internet and the things that the, the young people look at, the, the music as well that they listen to, their daily diet, their, their daily intake is somewhat of uh, like negative, the lyrics in the music, the, the fighting and the aggression in the video games. All of these things contribute to sort of like normalizing the behavior. Mm -hmm. And while this is happening, they are losing their ability to be empathetic. Because here I am, every song I listen to is gone man this and gone man that or whatever, or the video games. I have to kill how many people. I have to be so aggressive. It becomes part of them. And so now to take this life, because they spend a lot of time there, to take this lifestyle into the real world, when I am faced with a similar situation as in the video game, or is in the lyrics of the song, I sort of behave in a similar manner. And so our young people, first of all, have not learned how to exercise empathy. And as I said, these social media activities are decreasing on their abilities to be empathetic. And, and you mentioned empathy. Very good point there. Author, I'm going to bring you in. Same question. Um, I think Brunelli is so, so very correct. Um, one of the things I want us, I just want us to, to, to kind of focus on. Remember, these children have just, these students have just been under lockdown for quite a while, mm -hmm. right? So there is some degree of pent up energies. Um, so you would see them liming a lot. You would see them, you know, hanging out in tongue a lot. Uh, the other thing too, again, I go back to Brenda Lee's point about the about the violence within the the video games. They have spent a lot of time in front of, of devices, playing games when they don't have school. Uh, so that is, that is one of the things. But the fundamental thing, the foundational issue has a lot to do with, with their parents. Um, if a student or if a child is getting and feeling that um, he has backing from home to behave in a particular manner, you would, you would expect, you would see him behaving so without any fear or without any reservation. Uh, and and that, that to me is a, is, a, is a serious problem. While we have all the other things that we could, we could argue and, and, and lay down and say these are some of the rationale why, um, the foundation has to do with what was I taught, how was I, how was I brought up, how was I socialized um, to deal with the issues of, of, of you know, conflict, conflict between partners. Another thing is that, yes, our children might be home um, we don't have that sort of social um, interaction among, among, among people in, in our communities as we had before. Our playing fields are empty. Um, it's only because you might be in a, in, a, in a team or so that you may, you may have some, some degree of um, socialization. But by and large, persons basically would stay home or they may, wanna, they may have just one or two. We even have where now um, the, very, the, the very set video games where you might have two or three partners playing, you know, they are, they are different locations um, and they are playing the game. But the, 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 the crux of the matter is that we have been fed, students have been fed, adults have been fed. Issues of violence, not only um, in video games or in music, but in the movies. They sit down and they, and they are entertained. And whatever you feed your mind, you believe that, you know, it, it, can, it can happen. There's no reason I should, I should have the power, I should have that, my ego and my, my, my bravado is supposed to be above yours. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I can remember from a report um, in the United States when they, when they were looking at children and wrestling, professional wrestling, um, a lot of times students don't remember these, these people practice this day. It is almost like a, like a game to them, right? And young people were, were doing the same things that they saw on television as in professional wrestlers. And they were damaging and, and harming their, their, their colleagues as, as, you know, classmates. And so by doing the same thing. And, and they, they, they are not, they're not even conceptualizing that this could actually injure somebody. But it was for them, it was just a game. And I, I think we also have to bear in mind, again, I'm not a mental health expert, but uh, my basic psychology has taught me that your brain is still growing at that age. That's right. uh, your, 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 your ability to process issues uh, is, is not as cognitively competent as it ought to be, uh, right? And, and, and that is a, a, a variable that I think we also need to consider as well. Um, and, and, and Mr. Buckmeyer, is there anything else you wanted to add here to what? Yes, I, I'm there? glad you brought that up because in considering that in terms of the, the cognitive development of young people, I am still impressed that we don't have more violence. And I don't want anybody to take me out of context to su suggest that I'm calling for more violence in society or not. But I'm saying we should be grateful that despite all the daily diet of violent images and the violence that young people have to deal with in their homes, because a lot of homes, the only means of discipline that families exercise is violence, right? Violence against the children, violence against partners, violence against the neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to be grateful that despite the overwhelming diet of violence that, to which young people are exposed, we do not see a, an even more aggressive explosion of violence in our society. And, and let us also be mindful that this, in this period, while we see these occasional flashes in the flashes in the pan, the level of violence that we had a few years ago, and we need to be grateful for that as well. Because Arthur mentioned at the beginning, a period in the very recent history of Grenada where youth violence was rampant across the country to the extent where politicians felt they had an obligation to bring gangs together to negotiate peace treaties and that sort of thing, right? Obviously, one of the new realities, as everybody else has alluded to, is that social media is exaggerating these incidents by, by giving them the sort of wide broadcast that they're getting. But we have to recognize that young people are human, they're, they're, they're adults in development, and we cannot just give up on them. We need to continue to proactively design and implement programs that help them to learn how to have the conflict in their lives in every situation that they find themselves in. And uh, you, you are preempting an, a, another conversation that we'll be having, but um, I, I want to bring you guys back, uh, Brenda, both Brenda Lee and Arthur again. Uh, what about parental responsibility? Now, I, I remember growing up as, as, uh, as a child in Grenada, we were not allowed to watch television or listen to the radio beyond a certain hour. In fact, uh, our diet of television during the week uh, was relegated to one news. hour. Yes, uh, 30 minutes of local news, 30 minutes of regional and international news. And that was it. That was it. And uh, you, you, you were ordered to bed, you did your homework, and you went to bed, mm -hmm. right? Um, on, on, uh, on, on various television shows, you have parental guidance uh, advisories uh, that advises parents on, on the fact that uh, their children mm -hmm. should not be consuming particular types of of media content. Are we, uh, as a society, uh, have, have parents really caught up to the technology to the, to, to, to the extent that um, they are able to, are unable to really uh, have conversations, guided conversations with their children with respect to how they use the devices that they have in our hands? And what can we do as stakeholders to ensure that we are also uh, guiding parents in that respect? We do have a parenting program. I wonder if that uh, is, is even talked about. Anyone I think, I, 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 think I want to go first on this one. Uh, yes. because, because I have, I have the, the very debate and the very challenge with my children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I tell them the same thing that you say, that it was basically news and um, on weekends, maybe a Starsky and Hutch or some, some, some sort of movie that, you know, really and truly wasn't, wasn't violent. One of the things I, I recognize, though, is that as parents, we are not necessarily in the home all the time. 
both mother and father, and, and, and for example, the single parent, she might be, she might be, or he might be out of the home. The children have the devices, we provide the internet for them, and they sit and they look at whatever um, they want to look at. The, 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 they would not, on, until maybe, and, and again, I come to your point, um, until we may have a parent who says, look, I'm going to put some sort of parental structure, parental guidance on the device that they have um, so that they would not be able to access certain shows um, or certain things on the, on, the, on the devices that they have so that I, I protect them. But by and large, as parents, we spend a lot of time out of the house, all right? Um, and they entertain themselves for hours. If they are not engaged by their parents, all right, they spend a lot of time in, in, in you know, getting involved in these things because that's, that's what is in now. Um, in my day, we would have gone to the pasture and played football or cricket or go on stone mango or something of the sort. Um, but we don't have that. Children not doing that anymore, okay? Um, so... We have to, we have to, you know, really and truly. I, what, what I, for example, and I, I would use myself as the example. I sometimes have to sit down with my children and talk. Just have a conversation. Let's put down the device. Even as as parents, sometimes they they model you because you come. You might be busy, or you're on your telephone, you're on your computer. You have something to finish, and that is what they model. And sometimes the 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 the, the little conversation is not there on an evening or a, or a night time. Um, that that is what some sometimes I believe that's what we need to do really and truly have the conversation so that we would know exactly what's happening and you know we could deal with some of the issues that you're going through. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenda Lee, I see you chomping at the bit to get in here, so I'm going to give you a chance to um, respond okay. to that question. So, as Arthur was talking about the modeling of the behavior, recently I was out and I saw a family of four or five came in, and I was like, you can clearly mommy, daddy, children. And I was like, oh, this is so nice. They came to dinner, and whatever. And everybody pulled out a device. And I, I was like, why did you leave home? <laughs> why did you leave home? Right? Mm -hmm. So the, the modeling of the behavior. Of course, more parents are away from the home, the homes now than were in our days. Well, not so much you put out in, <laughs> in, in our days, but um to, to supervise. And so there is clearly less supervision. And Dr. Bob, life is a lot about balance. Some of the parents are compensating and overcompensating with the devices, buying it. Oh, I didn't have that when I was younger, so I don't want my child to this and I don't want my child. And they just give the, the children or the child a device, no real um limitations on how it is used, when it is used, for how long it is used, right? And so balance has to come in as well. They need their privacy. I am an advocate for children having a measure of privacy, but there is also the balance of the supervision. A parent should be able to just um, ask, Arthur, um, could I use your device? Can I and it should be okay. Or check in ever so often, establish this with the child, right? And let them know that I'll check in on you. I will be checking, not hovering, not being that kind of parent. As I said, it's about balance, right? And having the conversation. But it takes intentionality. The child should not be raised by the device in his or her bedroom. And I feel like that, that is what is happening. I, I, I feel as if uh, 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 <laughs> parents have deputized devices to raise their children. A society mm -hmm. has deputized law enforcement uh, to deal with these concerns that mm -hmm. uh, come to the fore because we, we are familiar with the saying charity begins at home. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, what about other resources in, in the community? I remember when I was growing up, uh, I had the public library to go to, for example, and that is another issue we will get to, but uh, you had different 4-H clubs, you had the, the scouts, you had girl guides, you had, um, uh, you know, all of these different uh, uh, extracurricular organizations that children could in, get involved. Now, I, I, I'm hearing you say that kids are not really doing those things anymore, and, and this is news to me. It, it shows how long I've been away from Grenada. So, gentlemen, anything else you wish to add here? 
Well, the reality is that these programs, these clubs and organizations did not compete with devices. So young people were desperate to be involved in something that had allowed them to, to have a social circle. And that social circle came from those programs. The Under 20 Club, which I was involved in for many years, was one of the best things that happened to me as a young man. But young people, because they didn't have all these fancy devices at home, they were, they were willing, almost anxious to get out of the house and be involved in things. So we need to remember that when we start conversations like this, we open up a lot of the, we, we open up space for bigger, larger conversations about how can society relate, how can society react, what are some of the things we as society need to put in place. I think we need to have conversations about this because despite the, the sort of lessening presence of organized clubs like the, uh, like the many clubs that we've mentioned, we also have intervention type programs um, and prevention programs that are happening, such as programs that legal aid run, that we would like to have an opportunity to talk about because all is not lost. I think that's the important thing. All is not lost. Our young people are, to some extent, in crisis, a crisis that is created by the reality of the day in which we live, right? But we can bring back, a, 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 we can go back to a moment in time, or if not go back, we can certainly create spaces and opportunities for families to learn to gel and unite and share again as we used to, understanding the reality of the devices, not trying to get rid of them altogether, but helping people to understand the balance of the devices and a quality of life that is inclusive, that allows for everybody to be together and share their concerns and so on and so on. It's a, it has to be an ongoing work. It's a work in progress. I'll be happy to come back at any point to talk about some of the interventions and prevention programs we have at Legal Aid, but I also believe we have to look at the broader issue of parenting and so on as well. Absolutely. Mr. Pear? I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about one of those clubs that I, I am actually involved in. I'm an officer of the Grenada Cadet Corps. Um, and the discipline I've seen exhibited by young uh, students in, in the Cadet Corps, um, I, I, I must say that I admire them. Um, we have taught them that um, if a situation um, occurs, you must comply first and then complain. All right? You have a responsibility. You have your rights to protect, certainly, but you also have a responsibility as an individual um, to show and to, and to exhibit something that, one, is patriotic, and two, um, that you that you are an upstanding citizen, all right? So they learn a lot of things, um, um, a lot of a lot of activities that would engage them to do critical thinking, to do problem solving, um, you know, to 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 be able to resolve conflict in a very mature and and you know and reasonable and just and justified way. Um, and I I must I say kudos to the to the, the Grenada Carico, um we have seen coming out of the of cadeting a number of our of our cadets um, taking high spots, um, high scholarly spots um, within the within within the um, the O levels, CXEO levels, and so forth. So that's why I just needed to add that. Yeah. Now the the issue of loitering, I, I don't know why that is an why that why we have come to that place. Uh, on my last visit to Grenada before the pandemic in 2020, I remember visiting uh, an old teacher of mine in, in Pomerose in St. David. And I remember passing along the St. David route, both at the St. David's Catholic Secondary as okay. well as the West Hall Secondary. And I saw these kids just hanging out on the side of the road. The same thing at the bus terminal. And it, it bothered me as someone uh, who remembered my days in Grenada where that at least with me and the, the children that I grew up with, we were we were doing something constructive after school. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? Has there been a breakdown? And I know that you mentioned the pandemic has sort of upended a lot of things, and and that is something we have to consider. But has there been a breakdown uh, in uh, the, the the structures that we have, or the the capacity that we have for 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 assisting kids after school, Brenda Lee? Mm -hmm. And there has been, and I want, I would like to go back to the home. I mean, it takes a village, and that's one of the things that we have to get back to. 
in terms of stemming, cubbing, and treating with this problem, right? The village has to go back to raise the child, right? But most of the times, the responsibility for us on the school, the days, the that, the that. We have to go back home. Children are at home. They are supposed to be given some level of chores to do. You remember the traditional chores? The young men, they had a sheep, a two goats. They had to go and, as we say, tie them out in the morning before they went to school. And so they had to get back home by a certain time to go and get the goats and the sheep to bring them back home. No, this was not wickedness. If you look at it, it teaches them responsibility. It teaches them um, time management. They have decision-making skills. They have to decide, do I stay on the terminals with my bears and not go and get the sheep and the goat? Or do I go home, right? And if I don't go home, suffer the consequence. We have to go back to home. Home has to be intentional, and here we're not blaming. It's not a blame game, right? Because blame helps nothing. Home has to be able to observe the son, the daughter, and the, the change in their behaviors. And if it gets too much, and we've been talking about some of the homes now are with single parents and mostly mothers. And if the child's behavior is getting, as we say again, out of hand, seek help, ask for help. Home has a critical role to play in establishing rules, in establishing values, in setting the foundational morals that the children need. You go to school, you have to get home by three o'clock four o'clock, whatever the time is, depending on the extracurricular activities the children are involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, gentlemen, uh, Tyrone, I see here. Yes, Mr. McMahon, go ahead. I absolutely agree with Brenda Lee, but we also, I also have to caution, um, home is not, home to have those functions effectively carried out must also be welcoming and safe. Yeah. And part yeah. of the reality of a lot of Grenadian children is that home is neither welcoming nor safe. Okay. Some children will do anything to avoid going home in the, in the evening because A, mm -hmm. they're faced with abuse, a barrage of violence. They're mm -hmm. faced with um, all manner of abuses and so on happen against them so that they, do, they, have, they have very little incentive or desire to go to that place that, is, that, that, that represents so much negativity and hurt for them. So while I completely agree, and, and I recognize that we have a, a role as society to help homes to get to that place where children feel that they have somewhere to go that is safe and nurturing. Because while, as long as they feel that it is better, safer to, to hang out as long as they can, find groups that give them a sense of belonging and safety and security, they are going to stay out. And staying out means that they are likely to get involved in negative behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Pear, uh, you need to unmute the microphone there. Mr. Unmute. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Sir. Um, yes, go ahead. I, I must agree with what um, both Brenda Lee and, and Tyrone said. Um, we have to teach our young children, our young people, responsibility. Um, the thing is, you know, the flip side to what, to what um, Tyrone is talking about, where the homes are not safe, we need to be able to have. Um, issues within the community, community centers. We have programs that you know they could rely on. They could, they could, they could, you know, look towards those areas to be able to to get some sort of safe space. Um, if if the thing is that we, we as Grenadian people, we are very proud people, and sometimes we like to say, let the home business remain at home, all right, without. And and you, you struggle there. Your 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 children are struggling there. You as a parent or um, a partner within a within a, a relationship is struggling, and you're, you're not looking for help. And you know it, it makes a bad situation worse. We have to be able to to look for for some assistance um, and and see what we can do to ensure that we send the correct message and and set the set the example and have the model that our children will grow up to be individuals that we can be proud of. 
What about uh, curriculum reform with respect to what we offer in our current uh, curricula in schools? Uh, our, our curricula, has it evolved uh, to address issues such as emotional intelligence, conflict resolution, uh, uh, management of technology in, in terms of how we, we manage our use of technology, both for children and for parents? Because uh, we do have IT, but of course it's it's application based. But but is it also ethical based, right? Um, in other words, do we do we have, or uh, have we gotten to a place where we are uh, we actually uh, developing our curriculum? And if so, what conversations have you as experts been having in that regard? So I know for the schools, most of the schools have. Uh, trained guidance counselor, right? Where topics such as all that you listed, emotional intelligence, conflict resolution management and skills, anger management. There was one point when the focus in the guidance sessions was solely on anger management throughout the schools in Grenada and conflict resolution management and skills. So um, the curriculum, there's always room for improvement, but I know that this happens. In um, the guidance counselors do that. There's also social and life skills on the, the timetable as part of the curriculum. And all of these things are taught. Um, during the pandemic, I know that Mr. Jovis W and other people were hosting Zoom sessions um, talking about the ethics of being online and the use of um, technology and social media. So again, more could be done, but some things have been happening. Uh, Mr. Peck? Yes, I, I do agree um, with Brenda Lee. Um, and trust me, I, I know that the, the guidance counselor within the schools sometimes have the, have the hand very, very, very full. Um, yes. dealing with, with some of the issues, not only just um, students, but with, with you know, fellow teachers and, 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 and colleagues. Um, <laughs> much more needs to be done, not just in the schools. I think sometimes we, we overcrowd um, and we clog the schools up with the responsibility of teaching the issues of life skills. We need to be able to, and I said that to Mr. Buckmeyer um, <laughs> on, on numerous occasions, and one of the things that he said, boy, we cannot do everything. <laughs> but we need to really reach out where our young men are. We have students who would have left, we have persons who would have left school, okay? And they are still struggling as to how to resolve a conflict, how to, how to manage the anger that they have, how to manage issues of sexuality. Um, and we need to really reach them where they are, on the blocks, in the corners, at the rum shops. We, we need to really reach out to them because, you know, it is the younger generation or those that are just a little bit older than the students that sometimes would set the trend and set the example for, for our young people, for the students themselves. Um, you know, when you, have, when you have students going out on the blocks and they're aligning together and, and, and they see you, you do this, that, or the other, those are the role models sometimes that a lot of our children um, pick up and follow. Mm -hmm. So we need, there is need, not just in the schools, I think within the primary and secondary schools, it is perfect. I think they, well, not perfect, but certainly much better than what we see happening in our society. But when they leave the school, when they leave the control of their teachers and the principal and even sometimes their parents, and they, they are going out there to basically fend for themselves, there is need for that social and psychological um, assistance so that they can cope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Buckmeyer, yes. Yes, and, and that need is to some extent be met in a small way uh, with limited resources. But again, I want us to always celebrate what is happening so that we do not feel despair. Mm -hmm. In the last two months, for example, Legal Aid and Consulate Clinic as part of a contract with UN Women under the Spotlight Initiative with Grenada, we have just invested over $70,000 in eight community programs that are focused on violence prevention with out-of-school youth, right? And this has been done in communities all around the country. Brenda Lee is one of the facilitators of that, uh, of the programs that have just completed. And that investment was very deliberate because we believe that the school curriculum cannot handle everything. There's only 
there are only so many hours in a school day. So the teachers can't take on everything. And so we, has, as Legal Aid and Consulate Clinic, over the last many years, have been deliberately seeking financial support from, uh, from donor organizations within and outside of Grenada. And we have been able to invest in programs at the community level that deal with issues like violence prevention, conflict management, et cetera, et cetera. We've just finished eight in the last two months. And as I said, it's a heavy investment. It's, a, it's a over 70,000 EC dollars. But that is, we believe it's a, it's a worthwhile investment because there's so many young people who will not be exposed to that kind of information at home or in school. And we are presenting opportunities for them to access the information in the community level, at the community level in spaces that they're comfortable with and that they would normally go to anyway. But for periods of time, we transform those spaces into positive learning spaces, and, and that is proven to be quite valuable. Last Thursday mm -hmm. night, I, I I was asked to speak at a session, it's not called, it's not called a junction with a group of men talking about sexual health, men's health, sexual health, and so on. And it's amazing how how people gravitate towards these sessions because we're going to them where they are. We're giving them an opportunity to get information and ask questions and get clarity on things that they're not sure of in settings that they're comfortable with. And I'm making a pitch here that I'm committed that we as Legal Aid and Council Clinic will continue to do that, but I'm making a pitch for other organizations to come on board as well because there's only so much one small organization like Legal Aid to do and there's a great amount of need. But these investments are worthwhile because we have to meet young people. I've supported Arthur strongly in this. Meet young people, people, both young and not so young, where they are with information that they need to answer questions that they have so that they're better able to make decisions that are informed about so many aspects of their lives. And what specific organizations are you making that appeal to? Are you talking about the Lions Club, uh, Leo Club? We're talking Grenada? about Lions, Leo, Rotary, Rotaract, um, mm -hmm. Boy Scouts, to the extent that they still exist, Girl Guides, uh, the Police Boys Club, the, the Cadet Co., and churches. You know, a lot of young people in Grenada, even if it's only because their parents tell them to go, a lot of young people in Grenada still spend a fair amount of their time in church. They're not all on the streets chopping one another. A lot of young people go to church on Saturday, on Sunday, they go to church Wednesday, various days of the week. Churches have a wonderful opportunity to create or to, 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 to bring programming like this to their to their congregations. And to accept that even if within the, the, the church community, they don't have the resources to do so, reach out to the secular organizations that are there that are able to do the work. Because where the young people gather, where they congregate, where they spend time, we must be willing to go to them. But sometimes we have to wait to be invited. And a lot of organizations feel that if we're a church organization, we don't want secular organizations to come in and do programming for us. So it's an appeal for all sectors of society, all levels, just understand the responsibility we have to raise the children, as, as Brendan said earlier. It takes a village, it takes a community, it takes a society to raise a child to raise a, a child that can grow up into a fully functioning, independent, contributing adult member of society. And to do that, it must be all hands on deck. And I know that there are organizations, both corporate sector, equity, and Grand Lake and, and, and Republic Bank and Cooperative Bank and so on, that are willing to fund such programs if you approach them with a good proposal. And of course, there are the overseas organizations, the United Nations organizations and others here in the Caribbean and outside that will fund programming around those areas because they recognize that there is a need that we need to address. Absolutely. And uh, folks, stand by. We will take a quick break uh, and uh, we would come back with our panelists uh, for some final comments as we close the program today. So uh, please stand by. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a legal schooling. I know you're sensitive to people schooling you on the law, but I think I can trump you when it comes to the history of Grenada. What you're saying is that this resignation was expected? What if we fair to say that you abdicated your responsibility by not showing up in Parliament on Friday? We are not aware of the terms of the agreement. But then how can you say the terms are not fair? But you don't know the terms. Well, we love we talk, we love gossip, we love brango, we love all the kind of things in the Caribbean. If I cannot play music, 
I don't know how I'm going to live. We are borrowing money to pay debt because of corruption, waste and mismanagement. That they have difficulty with your leadership. Why then are you contesting the presidency? You said All right, welcome back, folks. And um, I was happy to be joined this week by uh, a panel of experts uh, who work with young people uh, in Grenada addressing a myriad of issues that affect young people, uh, from mental health uh, uh, to developmental issues, uh, psychological health and things like that. In the wake of uh, that recent video that we saw uh, uh, from uh, the bus terminus area in uh, the town of St. George there, uh, I believe last week that video went Viral. Uh, so I, I want to bring uh, all of you back, uh, esteemed experts. And I think, you know, in these conversations, we have to rely on our experts to bring serendipity and clarity. And that's what we try to do here. And uh, to rise above, uh, as, as we say, the mawet and the noise. Um, because as they say, that what the noise in the market is not the sale. Is that the saying? That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> right. Um, so are there any factors or aspects of this conversation that you think we have overlooked that needs to be overlooked? I know, Mr. Buckmeyer, you have struck yeah. a very optimistic tone um, that all is not lost. And I believe, as I said before, that uh, the presence of, of social media seem to be amplifying these issues that have always existed in, in, in society, in my view. And so I, I would want to begin with you, Brenda Lee. So when we're looking at youth violence, we have to look at it um, in a biopsychosocial, um, from a biopsychosocial perspective. We looked at the biology to some extent, the lack of connection and attachment with the parents, the primary caregivers. We looked at the social aspect of it, but we did not look at the psychological so much, right? Now, some of our young people are struggling with conditions, mental health conditions, such as oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, ADHD, or attention deficit hyperactive, hyperactivity disorder. And all of these um, issues have come with, in terms of the presentations and the symptoms, they come with symptoms of aggressive behaviors. Now, if this goes by unnoticed, undiagnosed, and untreated, you see where we're going. So we have these acts of violence, and it may just be deemed as these children are disrespectful. They don't have, as we say, brought up see, and they are him and a half. Whereas there could be a genuine mental health issue that is undiagnosed and is untreated. So it just escalates and it develops into more violence. So I think I just needed us to say that and thank you for that question. Absolutely. Mr. Pear? Uh, I was so wrapped up in, in Bendeli's in Bendeli's presentation. Just give me that question again, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, is there anything that we missed? Anything in, in, in this latest conversation that we missed, that uh, that we overlooked, that that needs to be examined as well. Yes, I, and I think Brendan hit the nail on the head. The, men, the mental health issues are certainly um, issues that we we really need to to zero in on. But most so too. Um, just before we went to the break, uh, Mr. Bakmai was talking about you know having other persons come on board. Um, these these institutions, you know need training the persons who have to do interventions and so they would need some sort of help to to really and truly um you know train their person so that when they go to make those interventions in the community they could do it in a professional manner secondly we have the issue of our music or the, the issues of media um we talk about it but we have not said okay you know, we need to curb some of the issues that's happening on the media, in the movies. And so we need to adhere sometimes to um, the parental guidance that uh, the movies and so would, would, would say to us. We need to really, you know, get our young people involved in some some activities that would, would assist them. Um, again, just as Brenda Lee said earlier, and I want to repeat it, um, if parents are having trouble with their children, they need to reach out for help and, because help is there. 
we, ha we are in a society now where we have a number of our professionals, in, in like Brenda Lee and so, a um, number of our counselors and psycho psychologists and so, who can give some sort of assistance um, in, the, in the psychosocial aspect of things so that our young people can, can be the individuals that we really and truly want them to be. And uh, Mr. Buckmeyer, the eternal optimist. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to yes. uh, call you the eternal optimist here, Mr. <laughs> Buckmeyer. Well, I have to be, Dr. Bob, I've been in this work yes. for 34 years and I've always mm -hmm. worked with young people. And for me, a part of the conversation that we didn't amplify enough will be about those many thousands of positive young people who are doing well, who are contributing, who are representing their communities, their schools and the country remarkably well, who are eclipsed by these uh, flash in the pad events when we amplify negative events of individual young people when we allow one or two individual young people who exhibit bad behavior and bad habits to define a generation of young people who are trying really hard against tremendous odds to make it to do well. When we look at some of the programs we've had um, over the years that have benefited young people and we see the kinds of contributions and successes that young people have had, I will always be an optimist because I believe that if you give them opportunities to shine, to contribute, and to provide support, young people are willing, ready, and able to take up the challenge. And so let's celebrate those who are doing well. Let's hold them up so that those who are tempted to do negatively will, re will realize that there's another way they could go. And let us celebrate the good of the, the many young people who are holding their heads, their families' heads, and Grenada, Grenada's heads high so that we do not just pay them all with the same brush of negativity and disappointment. Because I believe, and I know for a fact, there are more that do it good than there are those out there who are doing bad. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Absolutely. And uh, staying in, in line with that positive tone, uh, we want to end the program with some a positive uh, uh, trajectories, or some positive conjectures for the future. Uh, Brenda Lee, I would start with you. So again, all hands must be on deck, right? We, we need to take a comprehensive approach to this, home, the government, the school, the communities, the individual. Young people have a lot of potential. We, we underestimate their abilities, right? So we need to involve them. We must involve them in things that matter that concern them. So we have to involve them in the solution. We need to provide safe spaces and places for our young people to grow and thrive and become. And Dr. Bob, we need to hold them in warm regard. Some of them don't know what warmth feels like. They just don't know. And so those of us who are trained or who work with them have a little more patience we need to hold them in warm regard, be patient with them. We're all growing, we're all changing, we're all becoming. The same is true for our young people. Absolutely. Very good tone there. And Mr. Pear? Um, one of the things that I know my children always tell me, Daddy must listen. And as a parent, <laughs> as a parent, sometimes we feel we know it all. Um, but we have to hear them out. They have their issues, they have their struggles. Um, and sometimes it just takes a moment of silence and true attention to them for them for you for us to understand exactly what they are going through. Take a time to, to reflect, take a time to listen, take a time to really have the communication. Because the, let me tell you, regardless of what we say, the statistics have shown that actually students listen out to certain students, but um, young people listen to their parents. They listen to what the family has to say. Okay. So engage in the conversation and take some time to listen. And you would realize that you could sort of help them solve some of the problems and some of the conflicts that they have internally as well as externally with the reason, with, 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 with you know, listening and so on. If you as a parent realize that you have an issue, reach out and try and get some help. Absolutely. And the resources are available oh, yes. as, uh, as, 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 as all of you just intimated. It's all also about reaching out um, and so this was a very important conversation that we will continue to have. We, in fact, uh, have many resource people in Grenada, very resourceful Grenadians 
uh, who are able to speak to this issue. And so we will be continuing a part two of this conversation in a subsequent uh, broadcast of the Bub Report, where we are bringing another panel of experts. We are also hoping to get the lived experience of parents, uh, parents uh, uh, who have a lot to say on this issue, because sometimes I, I feel as if uh, the parents' voice <laughs> tends to be drowned out, yeah, um, in this conversation. And in, in the spirit of responsible reporting, we will ensure that we are able to shed some very important context that sometimes tend to be missing in the mainstream media. So panelists, thank you so much for agreeing to appear on the Bub Report this week. We certainly appreciate your contributions. Thank Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, viewers and listeners, we thank you again for watching this episode of the Bub Report. And uh, we're also getting to the end of International Women's Month, Women's History Month. Uh, For our last episode of this month, we will be having a segment in which we will be paying tribute to all our women. As the saying goes, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. On behalf of the producers of The Bub Report, I thank you again for your spirited participation on this program. Have a great and wonderful week. Bye-bye.